Welcome to BizTech Forward, your go-to podcast for cutting-edge insights at the intersection of business and technology. Join us as we explore the trends, innovations, and strategies shaping the future of the digital world. Let's move forward together. Hello, and welcome to BizTech Forward, the podcast where we delve into the world of technology and business with some of the brightest minds at DataArt. I'm Ani from the Media Relations team, and I get to work with these brightest minds every day. So think of me as your friendly tour guide as we discuss the past, present, and future in tech. Today, we're going to talk about something that's quite important for every business leader, I would say, uh, and that is getting the best value from IT investments. In other words, how do companies evaluate if their IT investments are actually beneficial to the businesses? To unpack the topic, we're joined by Alexei Miller, Managing Director of DataArt, Alexei, hi, and thank you for being with us. Thank you, Annie, for having me. I would not miss it. The topic has two of my favorite words, value <laughs> and money or investments. <laughs> uh, Alexei has been with DataArt since its founding more than 25 years ago, and he actually helped build the company into what it is today, from a small team into a large global software engineering firm. And he has overseen business development, client relationships, and the expansion of the finance practice, among many other things. Alexei, again, great to have you with us. Welcome to the show. So let's get right into it. We're going to try to break it down in three parts, the past, present, and future. So let's start by looking back. Alexei, how did companies traditionally approach this? What was the way to measure the value of IT, like, say, three to five years ago? If you'll allow me, I would start way earlier. Three to five is basically yesterday. And when I think about the, the past, sometimes I find it convenient to look 30, 40, 25, 60 years ago when IT actually started, or at least started to take the shape it has today and gain importance that it gained uh, by now. And I think the way it started was kind of right. And in some ways, some ways, not all, better than now, because IT started by being helpful, by being a service that makes things simpler, faster, cheaper, making systems that allowed um, companies to process things better, to make fewer errors, to optimize things and therefore save on costs and so on. So simply put, IT started by being helpful and being a service, being a concierge, if you, if you will, to use a fancier, fancier word. And measuring value back then was a relatively simple exercise of measuring something before and after. Before IT, we had 100 people doing something. After IT, we have one computer that costs X doing something. And however, you want to you wanna measure, measure it. And um, because before and after could, me could be measured in something that is numerical or close to it, money, time, people, and, and so on and so forth, value was measured fairly, fairly straightforward. And frankly, I think it was healthy. I think it was for a long time relatively free of fluff. That today is a big part of the technology technology industry, and it kept this way up until I'd say the internet boom uh, of the early 2000s, late 1990s, when words like innovation, synergies, and others started to acquire additional meaning to what they are supposed to mean and so on. I know you asked me about three to five years ago, which is very recent, but I think it's helpful to look to this pre-internet IT, which had very pedestrian, very practical focus, which, like I said before, I kind of appreciate. So basically, it started out, the bottom line is to be helpful. That was the purpose, and I think that 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 purpose was the same as every other uh, function in the company. It was not exclusive to IT. You hire an accountant to do something to be helpful to the business. You hire marketing to be useful by helping 
promote promote the business. And you hire IT to to do to, to to do something something better. All 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 logical. It's just it's just in the early days of IT, it was very expensive. It was new. It was also very expensive. Computers were large and also very expensive. People who actually knew what to do with them were hard to find and therefore also also expensive. So it was very attractive because it meaningfully made things better. Mm -hmm. But it forced this idea that you have to think hard if you A, can afford it and if you can actually uh, actually drive value f from it. So uh, a, a questionable but kind of useful side effect of things being expensive is that you evaluate, unless you have enormous amount of money, you evaluate whether you really, really need that, that thing. So it was, it was helping itself be helpful by being expensive. I hope that makes sense. Right. I'm kind of intrigued by this word that you used, fluff. So when, when would you say, when did all the fluff start to come into play? And what do you mean exactly by that? Well, first, first I want to say that fluff is not a bad thing in business. I, 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 I guess half of uh, business transactions are based on substance, half on fluff. Fluff means promise. Fluff may translate into excitement. Those are not bad, bad things. They're less material than some of the measurable, measurable things, but they have their place. So it's important not to get carried away. So I don't want fluff to be, to be exclusively, exclusively negative. But let's just say over the years, starting roughly in the very late 90s and definitely accelerated uh, more recently, um, IT, the value of IT started to become more nebulous. Because, uh, of course, IT can create new capabilities. You can sell things on, on, on the Internet, which you could not do pre the Internet. That's new. And uh, sometimes you can provide other services on the Internet, which your customers may or may not need or may or may not be willing to pay for them. And that's more, that's more nebulous. It's not just about taking your old business, making it run better, more efficiently, which is very material and very measurable, like we discussed before. It's about creating something new. You're making a hypothesis about the, about the, the future. And what, what happened, I think, is IT people turned out to be amazing marketers. Amazing salespeople. I know it goes against you know popular logic that IT, IT people are these nerds that you know don't want to sell, don't know how to sell. They speak in these complicated words. They get irritated by business people because business people don't know what the hell they're talking about. All of that stuff. But there's this enigma about IT, and I and the business people are very willing to believe that there's something behind that enigma. And so inadvertently, IT have been very effective marketing of stuff, some of which business did not need. And I think that's the, that's the so business was very willing to spend money on something that was not fully measurable, not fully, not fully verified and so on, which is fine. Sometimes you need to take risks and maybe it's for some businesses that's more relevant than, than the others. But certainly um, when I say fluff entered this, this conversation, is that business somehow became uh, much more willing to pay for things on the on on based on this enigma? What about we try to bring this technology into the market? What about us bringing this? Wouldn't this be wouldn't this be great? Maybe yes, maybe no. How do we how do we know? Well, let's just try. Why this conversation was possible? Because technology got cheaper. Remember how we discussed it was reassuringly expensive. It right. forced you to have a long thought. Now, bring this product is only a million dollars, no longer a hundred million dollars. Let's just spend it and see how it goes. It's a viable logic, but that logic leads to leads to waste. Uh, and the other thing that um, that uh, is driving a lot of technology investments in the last 10, 15 years is envy. The other guy, the other bank, the other pharma company, the other e-commerce retailer has this gizmo. We must have that gizmo as well. And then there's this post-factum rationalization uh, of why we need this, this gizmo. That's not super health. That's nebulous. That's ultimately what I talk about when I say fluff. Right. 
Um, okay, that makes sense. And if we, we, I guess we can spend quite a while discussing like the fluff, the past and how it used to be, but uh, maybe like fast track to today, like would you paint us a little picture of how do you see it today? How, how has it changed? Where do we stand now? How do businesses measure the IT spending and the value now? Businesses have gotten a lot better at understanding technology. That's that's one thing. And that helps have substantive, serious, meaningful conversations about IT, what it does, and ultimately return on investment or value value for money. You know, this terrible cliche that was so prevalent 25 years ago that the boardroom does not understand technology. The boardroom understands technology now. And that's a good thing. It's, it, it, indeed, it's a great it's a great thing. So I'd say those conversations, those calculations have become more more meaningful. They've also become multidimensional. If they were, well, those years ago, is fairly simple before and after a single number or a, a couple numbers. They're, they're now uh, try those evaluations. They're trying, in, in a good case, they're trying to capture multiple factors. Obviously, financial impact. Are we going to make more money with this investment in technology? Are we going to spend less money? But also less quantifiable thing, uh, are we going to reduce risk? And there are many risks, cybersecurity risk, compliance and regulatory risk, business risk, competitive position risk, key person risk. There's so many risks. How do you quantify it? Technology has a very prominent role in that. And, yeah. and you, you need to find a way to express that, that value, that risk impact. Uh, in, in, in terms that are meaningful to your board, to your executive team, and ultimately to your uh, to your customers, that's different from every from for every company and from for many different industries. But it's certainly something that has entered in the conversation. People are trying, and and that's 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 a good thing. The other thing that entered the conversation, in my view, is I call it excitement. It's a, it's it's not not a word you typically hear uh, in 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 conversations that are supposed to be about cold business business calculus but tech has succeeded in selling this idea that technology creates new capabilities create technology pushes businesses forward it opens new doors it allows you to engage with new types of customers and and, and so on and so forth that, that's exciting exciting as in oh we can make more money that's one side of excitement but also excited as my people are more motivated. They love the tools that they're, they're using. They are excited to come to work or to work from their home office or wh wh whatever it is. My customers are excited by stuff we sell uh, sell to them. That is that is meaning meaningful, but it's ultimately excitement. How do you measure that? I've seen attempts to measure it in numbers. They're they're crude and I don't think very very successful. So I think in in the best case. Uh, businesses have come up with this multidimensional model of looking at what value means to them, to their people, to their investors, and to this customers, the holy trio of any business, employees, investors, customers, in no particular order, uh, and um, have, have learned to map this multidimensional uh, matrix to value onto this, uh, this trio. Uh, I don't think there's a unified way to visualize it. Everyone is out for uh, out for themselves, and um, that, that that's 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 a much much better place than where we were. I think in the early 2000s, when there was much much excitement and no meaningful conversation about it. It's, it's more sober. It's not perfect, but it's more uh, more, more sober. The other thing that is new today, relative to where we were 20 years ago, is that we have data. We have data on thousands of decisions, IT-related and business decisions that were made. And we know the impact of a collection of that decision. And there's a whole new field of decision intelligence, decision science, that literally takes decisions that were made, how they were made, under, under which conditions they were made, and the implications or consequences of those, of those decisions. And that decision science can be quite quite helpful in making better decisions going forward. Same thing here. Uh, IT, um, I mean, businesses have 
made thousands of business of IT decisions over the last 25 years, they know how it ends up and yeah. they can make value decisions based on that data, not just a hunch or not just, it's, it's not, it's not new anymore. That's, that's an interesting twist to what extent companies are willing to take that data into account. Are they willing to trust it or uh, is it just informing what they what what they're thinking um that that is individual for every for every client but we advocate for more and more data to be brought into those conversation historical data i mean mm -hmm. alexey you did mention this but i want to maybe um come back to it or um, have you talk about this a little more but you did say that there are things that you cannot measure that are more difficult to quantify and i'm thinking of you know businesses doing business together that means relationship trust strategic alignment people cultural fit how do you measure all that since it doesn't really show up on spreadsheet now does it like how do you quantify things like a cultural fit with an it partner from your experience i personally think you don't m measure it per se i think you judge it and and that may be same thing to a lot of a lot of people, but it's it's meaningfully different different for me. And what you judge is fit and comfort. And I, I'm coming dangerously close to uh, to talking about uh, decidedly not IT things like clothes and, and, and shoes. But I think it's useful analogy for me. Like when I when I buy shoes, I don't know you about you, Ani, but I actually buy quite a bit of shoes. And I go through a fairly similar process every time. Am I going to use these shoes for this system? You know, is it is it uh, too expensive for what I'm going to use it use it for? What kind of impact is it going to have when I wear it? Someone will be impressed. I will be impressed. Whatever whatever it, it is, and I have to somehow make this mental equation of whether it's worth it for me. But also, I try them, and I evaluate where I judge comfort. I walk in them. How do they feel uh, when I? It has nothing to do with their looks, or at least not not as not as much. But comfort matters a lot, and it's the same the same thing. And I ascribe certain value to that comfort. They look ugly, but they feel amazing. I'm not going to buy those shoes. They look great, and they feel amazing. I'm more likely to buy those shoes. It's same exact thing with your IT partners or IT projects more broadly speaking you you start so it projects are long and mostly painful and expensive and and then generally unpleasant in the sense that you know something's going to go wrong i mean it's not not all bad but sometimes in a in a long and complicated project there will be moments of of um, of, uh, of problematic moments along the way and so your experience while you're wearing those shoes or while you're going through that project, your level of comfort is something that's hugely important. Right. And you can't so much uh, measure it in money, but you can certainly judge the comfort. Another analogy that is uh, used often in our line of work is like when you start an IT project, make an IT investments, partner up with a new supplier, partner with the, or onboard a new platform, whatever whatever it is, it, you, you, it's like a taxi ride. You take taxi and Uber or whatever is taking you from point A to point B. Uh, what ultimately matters is the point B. Are you are you getting there? When sure. when it's a short ride, your experience of what you feel in the car doesn't really matter. But if point B is seventeen hundred hours away, what you feel while you are in that car actually matters a great deal. The seat, the comfort, the, dr the the driver experience. Do you have water? Do you have a USB charger to power your phone and so on? For you, really, really care about the comfort along along the way, and you should and can can and should uh, judge that that uh, comfort. But I, I think folks are being maybe a little too demanding of themselves when they try to measure. It. Just say what it feels like, just like with the shoes. <laughs> I love that comparison, both of them actually, but definitely did not expect shows and IT projects to be used in, it, in the same sentence. So thank you for that. That makes a lot of sense. I wonder, uh, makes me think uh, there are so many shows, Alexei, there are so many people 
doing IT projects. And this is what makes me think of comparing yourself to others. Where do you think comparison comes into play? Is it ever healthy to compare yourself against your competitors, you know, benchmarking and all that jazz? Is it ever helpful or healthy? Yes, uh, within, within reason. So I think comparison or envy or competitive envy is a very, very useful way to start many conversations. And it's a terrible way to end conversations. Mm -hmm. The other bank or the, uh, my competitor has this gizmo, this IT thing, is a great thing to know, very useful thing to say, to start the project or to start the process of thinking, do I need this, this gizmo? What kind of advantages does it create for them in the marketplace? What kind of advantages could it give, could it give me? So it's a great source of ideas, of intelligence and something material you know it's if they made an investment maybe it resonates with them what logic do they go, go go through but it's a terrible way to end the conversation because if i'm going to spend my money just because someone else has these shoes or pants or or it gizmo uh i have not done my work and that's not uh, uh that's not a good way to end, uh -huh. end the conversation so comparing uh, has its place for sure, uh, comparing with the idea of doing better is even 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 better than just just comparing. Meaning, uh, you know, it would be awful if all companies in the same line of business had exactly the same systems, exactly the same user experience. Uh, it's uh, it kills uh, innovation. So I, I love it when our clients come to us and say, I want a gizmo like my competitors have, just better. It, it, catching up is great. Sometimes you just have to do a defensive moves in business, all, 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 all that. I, I, I totally, totally get it. But this extra step comparing with the idea of getting one up on your competition is what really uh, drives the business forward and creates the exciting risky path for sure. But that's maybe for another conversation. Right. Maybe we should do another another podcast on risks uh, some some other day. On Today risk? I'm, I'm yeah. to talk about things that go bad. Risks, envy, and, and all that stuff coming the up. Seven 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 sin, sins of uh, business planning. Oh, that's for season two. Stay tuned, everybody. Um, we are moving on to. I think my favorite part now. Okay, so a brief recap. We did the past, the present. So, Alexei, let's predict the future now, please. No pressure, Alexei, but what is the future? Um, when um, specifically, um, how do you think businesses can actually make sure they're not just sitting there measuring IT value however they can, but they're actually getting the most out of it, especially when working with tech partners like Daytart. Well, I envy you, Ani, that future is your favorite part. Uh, I kind of like the past because I know the past. It happened and I can actually make bold statements about it without uh, being wrong. They're objective, though those things have objectively happened. Future, I have no idea. And therefore, I am very likely to be to be wrong. So, best I can offer is just some speculation about things that companies, many of our clients, partners, and others in the industry have to ways in which they should evolve. Right. So, I, I don't know exactly how it will 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 turn out. One thing that comes to mind here is. We all need to get better dealing with speed, speed of change. I, I, I mean, it's just, uh, it's just dizzying and discomforting to too many, and it manifests itself in in so many ways. I mean, the most banal, I guess, example, although it's weird to call banal something that is considered so exciting. ChatGPT came out two years ago, and it went so quickly from being the greatest disruptor everyone to everyone actually having chatbots uh, to now like 
why do we need all those all those chatbots? It's just it's not even two years. It's happening so quickly, and companies have spent a lot of money and a lot of time thinking about it. It scrambled a lot of IT investments. A lot of I know personally of a whole bunch of IT projects that had a reasonable idea of value that we're talking about. They have it. They had a plan, and then they said, "No, no, no, stop, stop it," because AI or, or ChatGPT or whatever might impact that. Mm -hmm. So it it it's on. It's happening so fast that it can have this paralyzing effect because. Everyone now understands, okay, the day after tomorrow is going to change again. Why, why bother? So that's, that's a little bit of a risk uh, today. We don't want this speed of innovation to be so blinding to us, so paralyzing that we, we don't do anything. We need to carve a reasonably, reasonably reasonable path, uh, path forward. Um, another way in which um, speed of change manifests itself is on a, on a human level, if you look um, at an average tenure of technology leaders in large corporations, it's getting shorter. And if you are a CTO, CIO, and you were hired into your job uh, 20 years ago, you could expect to stay in that job for five, eight, 10 years often. Now, many CTOs, CIOs are rotated every couple of years. How can you plan anything? Long term on a large scale, if you're not even sure you're going to be in your in your job. So there's this constant speed or, or constant change, uh, turnover in the C-suite, starting and restarting projects, and, and and so on and so forth. So right now, best I can describe, speed is dizzying to a lot of us, a lot of a lot of people. I certainly am not immune from that, and we need to all get better at dealing with with, with speed. In, in my view, keeping a cooler head and then ignoring some of the buzz uh, is is key to that. But many might di disagree uh, with with me with me here. Uh, it's it's a total cliche to say that IT has become essential and core part of most businesses. That's not going to change in the future. That's a fairly safe prediction uh, <clears throat> to to make. But my hope is that it. It kind of rediscovers its original purpose of being practical, of being helpful, of being this concierge that you use when you need to, that doesn't bother you too much when you actually don't need, need, need to. It, it's it's wishful thinking. I understand. I'm not I'm not expecting uh, us to go to the age of mainframe, uh, but we, we we IT people that is need to place ourselves in the in, in the right in the right position vis-a-vis -vis the business or or be the business in the appropriate appropriate for, format uh, and the the search for that balance for that right place will continue indefinitely right and if you could comment a bit more on the technology which you did mention a couple of times but technology will surely play keep playing a huge role ai data 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 everywhere Data will help measure things, obviously, but will the human element like still be <laughs> crucial? In other words, Alexei, will they still want us in the future? Uh, the question is, who's who's the, who's they? Will they want us? They are the humans, or they are the supposedly omnipresent non non humans? I have no idea, but I can tell you that I. I um, I admire the amazing progress that AI tech has made over the last 10 years. And I say 10 years purposely because that's when it really, really started to accelerate. I consider uh, generative AI to be a little bit of a sideshow. It's, it's, a, it's literally a gizmo that a lot of people got excited about that has utility, but that utility is somewhat, somewhat useless. But overall, the search for intelligence that can feed on prior human experience, make reasonable decisions and assist in our lives in so many ways from robots to computer artificial intelligence, computer vision, and so on and so forth. That is, that is immensely 
immensely exciting and i think it will be helpful and they whoever they are will need will need us but our uneasy union will be a pretty exciting thing to say and as a, as a an unwanted um uh, comment i know but since we mentioned chat gbt and generative ai can i just say i hate that term i think generative ai is just awful because it's so close to degener- degenerative ai and i think it's it's just it's just bad I, I know I said previously that IT people have been good at marketing, but here I think they've been awful. I think conversational AI is a is a better term, but no one's listening to me on this on this subject. <laughs> so I think I hope that this generative AI time twister kind of goes away. Now I have to ask uh, one last thing, um, kind of to bring it all home. Um, since we were talking about. Uh, measuring value of IT, how you you know maximize the value that you you know uh, can get from all the spending. Um, maybe just one or two sentences on like a key takeaway that you would give. Um, I don't know for companies to understand how do they get the most out of IT value today in today's world. Like one takeaway. I think. <laughs> I, I I think because things change so fast, trying to get it right has its limit. Get it somehow, limit your exposure, get on with it, prepare to be wrong, reevaluate, it's okay. We are all wrong about most of these things much of, of the time. And that's and that's okay. As long as you're not wrong to the tune of a lot of money that you cannot really afford. And as long as you're right a little bit more than you're wrong, uh, it's 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 all right, and, and it's uh, it's a great way. I was in, inspired in this. I know you asked for one or two sentences, but mm-hmm. I can't help myself. So um, everyone's favorite tennis player, Roger Federer, was giving a commencement speech com- commencement speech at Dartmouth College a few months ago. It was a great line there. He said, "In my professional career, I won." an ungodly percentage of matches, 80% of, 80 plus percent of matches. But guess how many points within those matches I won? 52%, 53%, something like that. Just barely half. The point he was making is, Mm. as long as you are right or you win more than you lose, you're going to be all right. And you can't get too stressed, too stressed, at least as a tennis player, uh, about points you lose, you got you got to move forward and focus on the next next one. And I think that kind of thinking applies to planning IT investments uh, as as well. Let's aim to be right a little bit more often than we're wrong, and it will work out. That's great. That's great stuff. That's the great note to end on. Uh, Alexei, thank you so much for talking to us today. It's been really really insightful. Um, and- thank you. Thank you to our listeners for tuning in to this Step Forward. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, write, rate, share, like, and stay tuned for more. And we always want to hear from you. Thoughts, questions, insights, anything. Reach out to us at vistepforward at datart.com. Thanks again. And until next time. See you later. Thanks for listening to BizTech Forward. Be sure to subscribe and rate the podcast to stay updated on the latest in business and technology. Join us next time for more insights and forward-thinking discussions. Presented by DataArt.